Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the MFC Auditorium for this afternoon's next presentation. Um, this particular topic is close to my heart about teaching software in universities, so I'll leave you over now to Andrew and Bob. Um, give us a hand. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so, as you can see from the title, this is about teaching free and open source software, in particular, free and open source software development at a university level. And last year, as you know, when we were at LCA, um, we handed out some brochures about a course that we were planning to give, and uh, we let the students know in the first lecture that it, it was a bit of an experimental course. We weren't quite sure whether it was really possible to teach the development techniques and the development habits and norms, the, the culture of free and open source software development within the framework of university lectures and labs and the normal university environment with assessments, etc. And for us, it was a bit of an experiment. And um, we're here this year to tell you that it was a resounding success. Um, we love teaching the course. Um, the students love taking the course. And uh, we were extremely pleased by the reaction of, from the community of the projects that the students got involved with. So there's really two points to this talk. One is to say what we actually did, uh, which I'll, you know, the first half of the talk will go through how the course worked, how we laid it out, what the students did. And the second part, the, the last part of the talk, is about um, what you can do uh, to try to encourage other universities to start teaching FOSS at, in, as part of their courses. Because what I'd really like to see happen is that FOSS development, the methodologies of, t of um, developing free and open source software become a standard part of computer science curriculums all over the world and software engineering curriculums. That'd be great because it'd be really nice to be able to feed our community with people coming out of their degrees at a university with knowledge of how the FOSS community works, what the best practices are, and them not to think of those FOSS developers as just the people with beards and, you know, speak a funny language, uh, like Orc and Grep and that sort of thing. Okay, so why teach FOSS development? Um, well, first of all, I should say what it isn't. It's not about teaching programming. There's plenty of courses that teach programming already. Um, this, is not, this is also not about teaching how to use, for example, the Linux uh, distributions, Linux operating system or other Unix operating systems. Again, a lot of universities, the students already get a lot of exposure to using a Linux desktop or a Unix system, um, some universities more than others, but it's very common at universities to already get exposure to Linux as a, a user um, at some level. Um, what it's about is teaching the development culture. It's the culture that the people here in the audience take for granted. It's the way you phrase an email to a developer when uh, you're reporting a bug. It's the way you uh, format a patch. Uh, it's the way you make sure that um, you can get on with the other people in a development community. It's a way to manage a project. How do you start a project? How do you keep people involved? How do you keep people interested? Now, those skills are the types of skills that many of you in the audience would just take for granted. It's become an innate part of your being that you do FOSS development and you know how, that what the norms are and how to get on with other FOSS developers. But it is something that can be taught. Um, usually, if you're not taught it, it takes quite a long time to learn. Uh, I've been doing FOSS development for a bit over 20 years now, and I'm still learning how to get on with people well. Um, and I'm sure, you know, how many of you learned something about FOSS development in some sort of structured learning environment, like a university? Uh, anyone here? Not many. Right. I'd like that to change. So in, in a decade's time at, you know, LCA 2020, um, what I'd like to see is half the audience say, yeah, um, when I did my course at whatever university it was, they taught me how to do FOSS development. So when I came out, I was prepared uh, to immediately become a productive member of the FOSS development community. So the particular course that we ran, uh, the basic, uh, basics of it was that it's a course called a COMP 8440. 
Um, it was part of the computer science master's program um, from the uh, computer science department or faculty of engineering at, at ANU. Um, and uh, Bob's a full-time member of that department, so it was great having him on board for teaching the course. Bob's been agitating for a course like this for quite a long time, been wanting to run something like this. And uh, when we got together and discussed it, we thought it would be a fantastic opportunity to do it together. Um, so we ran it in autumn 2009, uh, which basically means April 2009. And we're going to be running it again in 2010, uh, running from the 6th to the 10th of April, the intensive part of the course. I'll explain about the different structure of the course in a, in a minute. Um, the aim of the course was, was a combination of both practical and theoretical training. So we wanted the students to feel comfortable by actually doing FOSS development, doing some, getting some patches in, getting some feedback, learning how to actually develop stuff themselves, as well as understanding FOSS development from a theoretical point of view, where we describe some of the elements of the culture using some of the, um, the tomes written on this, the Cathedral and Bazaar type uh, articles and other articles on the, um, uh, the anthropological, if you like, view of the open source community. How does it work as a community looking at it as an academic from the outside? And we wanted the students to appreciate it both from that theoretical point of view and from the practical point of view of how you send a patch without getting flamed on the kernel list, for example. Okay. So we wanted the students to be involved with real FOSS projects. Um, this contrasts a little bit with some other courses that have tried to teach FOSS development where they have little sandboxed projects that are in a safe environment away from real projects. And that's partly, I think, out of um, some trepidation about how the projects might react to the students. And we decided instead that we wanted the students involved in real projects self-selected projects. The students had to select themselves which project they wanted to get involved with. And because we wanted them to get the experience, not an artificial experience, but a real experience of how real FOSS projects work. And we wanted the students to start to understand the, the FOSS community. Um, and, you know, so they could come along to a conference like this and not feel out of place. Okay, the course structure, uh, we used an intensive format. So there was a a five days, very, very intense teaching, uh, where Bob and I, our voices were sort of uh, waning by the end of it. So each day um, started at nine in the morning and went till typically 5.36 in the evening with a, a break for lunch. Um, and uh, each of those days we had three lectures and two labs. Uh, so there was a, a lecture, a lab, a lecture, a lab, and a lecture. Um, in fact, sorry, there was two lectures, one either side of lunch, and then there was a lab towards the end, the lab tailing off into the evening. Uh, that got us enough lectures to cover the theoretical material, and the, the lectures were mostly about the theoretical side of FOSS development, and the labs were about the practical side of actually getting involved. Um, I should say, by the way, uh, if you've been to one of my talks before, I encourage people to heckle or ask questions during the talk, so if you do want to, you know, divert the talk off to a different uh, tack and talk about something, you know, vaguely related to this topic, please feel free to, to put your hand up. Yep. I used a bunch of books. That, that book I didn't draw a lot from. Uh, Carl Fogel's book, um, which was a book on basically how to start a project using the Subversion Project as a, as a great example. That was probably a closer uh, one, but I'm, about textbooks, I'm actually going to be talking a bit about textbooks a bit later, um, because we're, what we're doing now is actually creating a new textbook. Um, and so there's, there's an ongoing effort, which I'm hoping to get more people here in the audience to get involved with. So um, after the intensive, the five-day intensive period from the Tuesday to the Saturday, we then had uh, a month to prepare assignments. Uh, so the students... During those, that month, the students could come in to a couple of labs on uh, Saturdays and where they could work with Bob and I to work through any issues they would have with the assignment material. Um, and they, at the end of the month, they had to submit two significant assignments, where the assignments were typically um, uh, 10 to 20 pages, 20 pages roughly, of work. Um, one of the assignments was a practically oriented assignment and one of them of a more theoretical nature. 
So, this is the lectures, uh, just to give you a rough idea of what we tried to cover. And um, I can use this fancy little laser pointer and point out some of them. So, on the first day, we just sort of introduced things, introduced how FOSS works, um, basic overview, because the students, some of the students uh, were already familiar with FOSS, some of them had contributed to projects, um, but most of the students hadn't. Most of the students, FOSS was a fairly alien concept, and they needed to get introduced to it gently about the whole concept of doing free software, uh, why people do it, etc. Um, how to get started a FOSS project we did towards the very beginning because the students were about to do a lab where they would have to get started in a project. And we, as you'll talk about in, in the lab slides, we tried to introduce it a little bit gently where they got involved with the projects within the lab on the first day before they started going to external projects where there were people outside of the university environment involved. Uh, source code management, that came fairly early. We initially thought that would be later on. Oh, thank you. Not I safe. Okay, I don't point at this one at the audience apparently. And which way round do I do it when I'm, ah, oh, that looks good. Great. So source code management, um, that was originally towards the end. We didn't think it would be that critical, but we found that the students were really struggling with checking out the latest Git version, the latest SVN version, the latest BZR version, CVS, whatever. Uh, we were surprised to find that the students, even though they were master's degree students, had extremely little familiarity with source code control systems. And they didn't know the basic concepts of a checkout, uh, you know, the logging, um, that type of thing. So we decided uh, at that point, I, I shifted the lectures around a little bit after the first lab and moved the source code management back to the first day and gave them a very quick introduction to um, how to use the major source code control systems, a quick cheat sheet, if you like, with some examples. And that meant that they got unstuck from that first lab, and the next lab made a lot more sense to them. Um, the history of FOSS went through some of the, the early history from the, the basic idea that FOSS really started back in the mainframe era, where FOSS was just the norm, where you know companies would release their software as free software because they just couldn't imagine doing anything else. People wanted to buy hardware. Who would pay for software? Um, and that's really where it sort of started, if you like, you know, archaeologically in the IT industry. Through the, through the whole, you know, BSD um, system, all the various System 5 type releases and um, uh, Windows and other Microsoft involvement, the whole sort of history of FOSS in a rather similar way to the way Carl Fogel treats it in his book on the history of, of free and open source software. Uh, moved on to how projects are governed. Uh, one of the things we wanted to teach in this course is how to be an effective project leader. And you need to understand project governance in order to lead a project. You have to understand the different options you have for voting systems, for having a release manager, for having somebody that looks after the website, somebody who's in charge of the security uh, releases, somebody who's the, you know, the Bush lawyer who looks after the legal issues. Um, all these types of roles are, are needed for, depending on the size of the project. One person project, the person just wears all the hats. Uh, for, for larger projects, you tend to have more roles defined. And, of course, there are different governance structures. So we um, contrasted the Apache governance structure to the structures used for something like KDE, to the, to the ones used in the Samba team, to used in the Linux kernel, etc., and tried to point out the, the uh, different strengths of the different governance models that are used in the free software community. Because there, there isn't just the one governance model. There are, of course, you know, as many governance models almost as there are projects but there are some overall themes in governance models in, in the free software community. Um, what we w next went on to FOSS in business, how people make money out of free software, because some people do. Uh, I mean, how many of you have some sort of corporate sponsorship for somebody paying for your trip? Uh, I don't here, but anyone? Yeah, so a fair bit of the audience, right. So there's a whole bunch of business models, and we broke it down. There was a particularly good article um, uh, that broke down the business models of FOSS into five basic categories, and we went through those categories and gave examples and tried to explain how business can work, because some of the students were a little baffled by how free software could actually survive in a commercial world. And all of you know that there are many ways that free software projects do thrive um, within the business community, and the students needed to understand how that's possible. So motivation for FOSS developers. 
um, that one I think is very important because in order to get on with your fellow developers, you need to under have some understanding of the differing motivations you get between developers. And so we went through the types of scratch and itch type motivations to motivations based on um, trying to get products done to just the um, you know the technical thrill of things to the excitement of flying a rocket, um, all these types of things. You know the all the different motivations you get in the free software community. Um, I did a case study uh, as I've had a lot of experience with the Samba project, so I decided I'd do an in-depth case study on that because uh, at least no one or not too many people can contradict me about that one. Uh, and so went into that, and, and some of the, the ups and downs and some of the interesting pieces that have happened over the years. It, it's, a, you know, it's a project with a very long history, and some very interesting episodes um, have turned up over the years. And so I went through some of those episodes and how they affected the further development of the project. Um, moved on to um, uh, distributions and platforms. And this is, uh, uh, Bob gave a lecture about how the the different distros work, how Fedora, um, Red Hat, um, you know, all the various Debian and other, other community and the enterprise distros, how that works, um, why there are so many distros, um, hundreds of them, um, what motivates people to create a distribution and, and how the, the distros are structured, um, which is very, very important because these days most people who are, most people at this conference would have probably installed from a prepackaged distribution. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, two-thirds of the audience would have built up their, their system from scratch, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, but early days, people would have built it up from scratch. So FOSS culture, um, that talk was about how the culture of, of free software works and uh, how the, the expectations, the norms, the um, uh, why people don't like particular ways of doing things um, why forking is um, something that is very important but discouraged. So something that people will fight for the right to fork but discourage you from doing it. And that sort of comes down to the, the way the culture works. And it's a very important thing for people to understand because if you just think of FOSS as a set of rules, you won't get anywhere because the rules don't map on to the way the people's attitudes and you're not paying the other people on the team in, in the project usually you have to get on with them at, a, at an engineering level and at a social level. And to do that, you've got to understand the culture. Um, next one was how to start a new project. Uh, if you did have a new project, and none of the students actually created their own project from scratch in, this, in the time of this course. That would have been a bit of a big ask. But we wanted them to understand the process that was involved and the types of decisions that the, that the project leader uh, has to make in establishing the project in the first place. And... This next one, FOSS Tales, that was really, it's related to the FOSS culture. And that talk was about some of the major events that have shaped the FOSS community. So, for example, um, the, uh, the whole QT, GNOME, KDE um, debate, the whole debate over BitKeeper, uh, the debate over GCC, EGCS, um, these things which are all part of our, our history and they affect how we react to things now because of what's happened in the past. So people coming into the community, you know, new students coming in and learning this at university, need to know some of this history, uh, at least from one person's point of view, um, need to know a bit of the history to get an idea of what these backgrounds are that people talk about so that they don't put their foot in it and so they understand some of the reactions they might get to particular proposals. Uh, because these major events that... that crossed over the, almost the entire community, um, uh, have an enormous shaping impact on, on the way the, the whole community works. So the final one was a you know, release early, release often, which was really a wrap-up type talk, a, a summary of the whole course. That was after the, the end of the five days. And um, it was just to sort of uh, allow the students to try to um, allow some of the material to sink in a little bit and uh, opportunities for them to ask questions about the force as a whole once they'd uh, seen enough of it in the lectures. So this is uh, what the little environment, it was a fairly small course. We had 21 students. Yep, question. Sorry, with the lights, it's hard to see. Documentation. Okay, the lectures did talk about how documentation works, and I was very pleased to find that a fairly large proportion of the students chose documentation for their own projects. 
So they chose in particular translations uh, or working on improving websites, that type of thing, which is, of course, the type of thing that you can get into fairly quickly in a, in a very short time frame when you're just getting involved in a project. And it's a good way to get going in a project, to work a bit on the documentation, to write a how-to from the point of view of a new person to the project, etc. <coughs> so we very much encourage that. Um, because not all of the students, there was a prerequisite to have some programming knowledge to do the course, but it, it wasn't a requirement to, to be a strong programmer. And some of the students weren't very confident with writing code. Um, they, they could sort of read a bit of code, but they didn't feel as though they could really send a patch to the kernel and, and actually, you know, uh, have it be accepted. And so for them, they t them working on the documentation on translations, that area, was absolutely ideal. Uh, so documentation was, in fact, you know, quite heavily emphasised. Yep. Any other questions? Have we gone? No. Great. So this is what it looked like. Um, you can't read the slides there. It was a very a small room, 21 students. Um, we're actually glad we had a, a quite small group like that because it was so intensive working with the students. It meant that between Bob and I, was, there was you know 10 students each or 10 and a half. Um, and we were able to get around the lab and give them some personal attention, which worked extremely well. So I would recommend that you keep a, a small class in this sort of course. Question up the back there? Yes, here I am. Yep. How do you train the trainers? In other words, by 2020, we expect maybe a lot of us out there teaching. Right. Or how do you expect to okay. be sca scale a little bit? One of the things I'm going to be talking about a bit is um, an attempt to create a textbook based on this course and the fact that all of the videos of this course are available. Every lecture is videoed um, and all of the lecture notes are available. Now, that means if somebody... If, if there was a lecturer out there, uh, are you a lecturer yourself? Are you a teacher at university? So you could, um, if you wanted to run this course, one way to do it would be to sit through the lectures as videos to see how it was presented and to read through the existing lecture notes, which are all available under an open license. Um, and then to also join uh, a, an online community called the Teaching Open Source Community, which is attempting to create a textbook loosely based on the material from this course. Um, which could then be, and it's an open, freely available textbook under a, um, a community license. So the idea is to then create the teaching materials so that it can be adopted at other universities around the world. Uh, and that was one of the, the main aims of this course. I didn't want, you know, teaching 20 people is great, but I wanted to seed something which could teach 20,000 people or more. Question down here? Right. So how did you get on in Australia? Okay, that, I, I, the initial contract that I got, I, 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 luckily I've got a lot of experience with dealing with legal contracts. And um, uh, so I was given the initial contract and of course it, it wasn't ideal for doing a course like this because it just wasn't structured towards the idea that you're going to be releasing all the lecture notes and videos and everything openly. And the university was extremely accommodating about that. And basically, I said, you know, that's no good, that's no good, that's no good with the GPL, that's good, can we add that wording? And they said, yes, 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 and yes, all done. And so the contract was absolutely fine. Um, it helped probably the, the lecturing fee was going to charity, um, to uh, CASE, the, a, uh, the com, uh, computer assistance support and education organisation that uh, t helps uh, deploy free and open source software um, at community groups around Australia. And uh, that means we start off on the right foot because we're not just trying to steal all this stuff and you know, run away with it, right? Um, and so they, they understood very quickly the, why we wanted a FOSS course to have open course materials. And so um, I hope that when this is done again, when people improve the, the course materials, that they will you know, contribute it back and that it will, you know, we'll get a whole lot of new modules. We won't just have case study SAM, but we'll have case study a whole lot of other projects um, and people will then be able to mix and match the various modules to create something suitable for their own uh, university environment. I'd like to add that uh, the university's contract was more geared towards protecting the university's interests against Andrew walking off with the material, and Andrew was trying to convince him what he's trying to do is actually make it available for everyone, and they just didn't, initially didn't understand that that's... Yes. That you weren't actually trying to protect your interests, you were actually trying to make sure that the material was, was open for everyone. Right, There's it a, was... It was really good at the university to be able to say, yes, you can just rip and change that contract, you know, whoever you like, and, and it worked. 
So um, in terms of uh, practicals, do you, uh, do you create the practical based on industry certification for Linux or you create your own? No. No, we, we, we didn't base the curriculum on any sort of certification. There is no certification involved in this course. Well, of course, you, you can get a master's degree out of it or one portion of a master's degree, which is a pretty good certification from, you know, when it comes from a university like ANU. Um, but uh, it wasn't aiming... The certifications tend to be oriented towards being a system administrator or a user of the system, knowing how to use the system. That wasn't the aim. We wanted people to know how to develop the system, how to be part of the community, and I, I don't think any of the certifications are really oriented towards the culture of free and open source software. I mean, I might be wrong. There might be one out there that I'm not aware of. Um, so, no, it was a completely new curriculum from scratch. So I hand over to Bob now. Bob ran the labs, and so he was going to talk about how the labs worked. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so the very first lab exercise we gave people was to compile up A2PS. And A2PS is an interesting um, project because... Uh, obviously, in the Ubuntu distribution, which we gave the students to play with, there was a source package for it, um, but we encouraged students actually to go and find the upstream source for that, and it turned out there's actually multiple upstream sources, and uh, so there was a bit, of, a bit of interesting discovery going on there as different students uh, wandered down different paths to acquire the source code and then build it, um, and required lots of dependencies to be built, etc. So it gave students a bit of a feeling for how complex some open source projects can become in terms of um, the revisions of source code and the rest. Um, they went on then to look for a project to actually uh, contribute towards. There were five different projects suggested and they were able to um, go outside those five if they had a good case, but we tried to, uh, to keep it to those five. And they ranged from fairly reasonably easy to reasonably tricky type projects, but fairly normal sorts of things like Wesnoth and um, stuff like that. Um, then the next day they had to go and find a project to contribute towards, um, c contact the developers, indicate what they're going to do and um, find out what sort of work needs to be done in those projects. That actually leaked over into uh, day three quite a lot. Uh, people were still trying to pick projects in day three. So generally speaking, really well. Um, some didn't get back at all. Obviously, the project was in some form of hiatus, but, uh, but quite a few of the projects, surprisingly large number of them actually, um, got almost immediate um, feedback from the developers, which was really great for the, the, the students in our course, really positive for them to, uh, to um, get that sort of feedback. And also, some of them put themselves down as, um, I think one of them was the some Hindu language translator for the Eclipse project, mm. and they were accepted and they were actually put up on the Eclipse project webpage next day as the official, um, what was the name of that language? Oh, I forgot the name of the language. Uh, some um, particular dialect of, yes. uh, in, in, from India. And, um, yeah, there they were on the, uh, the Eclipse project webpage as the official uh, language maintainer. So that obviously gave them great incentive to get on with the work. They were delighted. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So you uh, didn't um, tell the projects that they were um, to be, be expecting these students before they rocked up? You just let no. it be the, the experience just as it, as it... We didn't notify the projects because um, we didn't know which project students were going to pick. We basically wanted the students to get involved in a, an open source project on their yeah. own terms rather than... But they did tell them that there was part of a course as well, yeah. so we, we weren't trying to hide that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, just clarify a little bit about the contributing choice of five... The, the, the one contributing Choice of Five projects, that wasn't their main project they were working on. That was, there was just a Choice of Five and they sent patches between each other, between the students, to get the idea of sending a patch, doing a commit, applying it, and they all had to send a patch and reply to a patch, right? So comment on some, some other student's patch. But that was just a, the one lab. And then, then they moved on to picking a project, a much broader set of projects where they had to go out and use fresh meat and, you know, other package things to find a package. So the, 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 choi the choice of five was the narrower lab to get them used to sending patches and receiving them and that sort of so thing. So we had our own mail list for these students to mail to and submit their patches to and download them, etc. And then the day five, or basically most of the day other than the lectures, was taken up with the video. The students gave presentations about the project that they'd chosen um, in day two and how they'd participated in that and what happened. And um, there were like five to ten minute presentations and some of them were really very, very excellent. Some amazing uh, results in just a short period of a few days. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I was just wondering, what's the overall level of interest? Uh, did you find that people who were coming to attend the course already had knowledge about FOSS, or did you find people with no prior knowledge or interest were, were looking forward to the course? S some had some prior knowledge, but the vast majority had never been involved in FOSS development. Most of them had had some exposure to Linux in the ANU computer labs before, but I'd say at least maybe two-thirds, three-quarters of them had never, you know, been a developer or in any sense of actually working with the source code repository for a FOSS project and working with the mailing lists and that sort of thing. Yeah. Is, that, is that another question there, or are you just exercising your arm? Uh, uh. Did, they <clears throat> did they continue with your involvement with their project after the course ended? Yeah. <laughs> Some of them very much did. Um, I can't see who's, who's asking the question. Oh, there. <laughs> yes, some of, them, some of them very much did remain involved with the project. Not all of them remained involved, but some of them then actually roped other people into the project and got them involved um, to do new translations or to do new patches. Um, and so I was delighted to see a number of the students turning up at the club meetings uh, in the, the weeks following the course and the months following. Um, we didn't get, you know, 100% success in that level. It would have been nice if all of the students became, you know, developers. But, um, uh, I mean, they've all got their degrees to get on with, and so it was great to see that some of the students did continue to, to be involved. Sorry. Yeah, it's somewhat disturbing that students are getting to that level and don't know even the basics of source control. Is, is any of these, I mean, obviously, the basic source control is one thing, how to use Git you need to understand in a way as master's way. students didn't necessarily come through the undergraduate program at the same university. So many of the master's students in this course might have been coming in from other programs in other countries, and then they're coming and doing a master's degree at ANU. If they'd done an undergraduate course at ANU, I'd be extremely surprised if they didn't know how to use a source code control system. But um, at a master's level, you do get a great mix of backgrounds of students. Um, okay. I have a question. Um, regarding those students, the, the, the developers don't get back to them. Um, what happened to them? Do you have to create a new project for them, or do you just I, leave it? I think two students decided to shift to a different project. One of them decided to keep using the original project as, from a theoretical point of view, analyzing it, which didn't really require the project to get back to them, because you were looking at it from the outside like an anthropologist, um, but then chose to use a different project for them to actually get involved with and, and patches and, and documentation, etc., cetera, um, because the first project wasn't very responsive. And um, it's, but the vast majority of projects responded extremely well. The, the, really, the, the one that sort of was the, um, the absolute corker was when Brad Hards from the Open Change Project, he got an email from one of the students um, saying that they were doing this course, and he decided to come into the lab. He happened to be in Canberra, and came in and sat next to the student and worked through problems with him, right? <laughs> Which is. <laughs> Quite amazing. I mean, but of course, Brad is an incredibly enthusiastic is developer. Is Brad here? Brad, Brad's is Brad around? Brad's somewhere. I don't yeah. know if he's in here today. So, and, and, and yeah, the student was blown away by that uh, because he was interested in using Open Change actually at work. He worked in one of the public service departments at, uh, in Canberra and he was used, interested in deploying it and he had some questions and he wanted to do some patches to make it more appropriate for his use in the public service. And to have one of the core developers turn up and sit next to him for you know, half a day uh, was really quite an amazing experience for him. Um, so as the uh, course is part of the academic endeavours of the university and that's one of its core, core businesses, I feel um, entitled to at least say something about the Australian National University, which is in Canberra. There's also the place where we had LCA 2005, for those who are there. Um, the Australian National University is um, consistently ranked amongst various ranking systems out there as one of the, uh, oh, sorry, the top university in the Southern Hemisphere, not just in, in Australia but in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's a, it's a wonderful university to work at. Um, it has a deep tradition with open source, especially with the Samba um, and R-Sync projects, which uh, were basically all done by, by Tridge, but uh, while he was studying his PhD, which, and sorry, Paul McCarris with R-Sync sitting right here, and there are a few others as well who, uh, who have been through um, the, what was the Department of Computer Science, now called the School of Computer Science in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. So um, it's a great university, and I'm very proud to work there. Um, in terms of our labs, we used to have five 20-seat labs, but the head of our school, um, 
when asked, I asked him if we could uh, modify that a bit for this course and he agreed to have part of the wall pulled down between two of the labs so we ended up with a, a large 40 seat lab which is the, the lab we ran this course in and that lab has since become a flagship lab for our um, school so most of the, uh, the prime sort of high profile courses and events that occur now going on in, go on in that lab because it, it just feels such a nice lab. And I was looking for a photo of it earlier. We couldn't find one, but um, it's a great space. It's very open, um, lots of room. And uh, the, the five labs are all equipped with Linux machines. Um, we have a standard operating environment which gets re-imaged every time the machine's rebooted. It's done with a, a particular process which we developed in-house. So it's very, very fast. But um, one of the pro problems with that is that uh, obviously if the machine gets rebooted, uh, any modifications that have been made get lost almost immediately. So Andrew and I developed a, a um, different way of doing things where we used an unused partition on the disk to store an encrypted file system. Now, one of the problems is that the lab is also being used by undergraduate students, not during the course, but certainly during the month after the course when uh, our project, uh, the students doing our course, were expected to continue working on their projects and we didn't want their projects to be disturbed too much by undergraduates doing things on the computers. So we put an encrypted file system on a spare partition and the, um, the students of our course actually booted into that encrypted partition and gave it the password so they could uh, to log in and, and do the work they needed to do and feel reasonably confident that when they shut the machine down it would uh, not get too badly um, compromised by undergraduates later on. We also have a, um, a backup server running which um, used the the hard link, copy hard link sort of mechanism to uh, back up all those machines. They were all running um, Ubuntu Intrepid at the time. It was in April and it was immediately before 9.04 was released. And in fact, 9.04 was released, I think, on day two of our course. And one of the students actually in, upgraded the machine to, to Jaunty um, in order to get some new libraries they needed for their projects. So some of the students were pretty game in that respect. And we also had a dedicated server we used um, which allowed us to um, bypass the university's tr um, trafficking kind of um, bandwidth limiting stuff so that we could actually give the students of our course direct access through the internet and they could download as much as they needed. So I a question. Is yep, a question over there. Yeah, a question. Um, do you think if this is, um, uh, this was taught as a graduate course, it seems to me if this were taught a bit earlier um, as a freshman or sophomore course alongside yep. algorithms and data structures yep. that some of the false principles might actually percolate throughout uh, you know, yeah. a, a student's yeah, I, academic career. I think it could work as well as a second or third year course. Um, it happened to fit in with the way the master's program works at ANU and as experimental course. Plus, um, I mean, I was very kindly given time to give this course by my employer, IBM, are very generous of them, but it would have been more difficult if it didn't spread out over a whole semester. It was easier as an intensive time when I'm working full time. Um, and so that you know, fitted better in with the way the master's program works. But um, yes, if you want to run it at another university as an undergraduate, then I think at second or third year level it could work very well. Uh, I could say that all of our undergraduate, almost all of our undergraduate courses use Linux and the lecturers would teach you know, some of the basics of software development, including using Make and some of them actually do use SVN for their courses. I teach a computer networking course and we use SVN and stuff like that. So there is a lot of Linux and open source stuff going on, but not this kind of um, deep insight into the legalities and uh, the culture and all the rest of it. That's sort of left to this course. So we're running a little low on time, so I'll just move on a bit quickly. The, the assessments, so there's three parts to the assessment. They did a short uh, presentation in front of the whole class, which was then videoed and marked by Bob and myself. Um, they, did a they had to do a practical contribution to a project and write up a report on their contribution. So, for example, the report contained cut and pasted IRC logs of their discussions with project members, that type of thing, cut and paste from Bugzilla entries that they put in, that type of stuff. And then a project study, which was like an anthropological study of a project. And the project study covered things like history of the project, the relationship with other projects, bug tracking, release management, legal and licensing, motivations of developers, etc. Uh, so they're expected to go into quite some depth onto the, their chosen project. So the reactions, as I mentioned, was extremely positive. You can see there some of the projects the students chose, uh, some games, an editor, various um, audio things, um, MediaWiki, Eclipse, FreeCol, a whole bunch of projects that the, the students all chose themselves. We did give them a lecture on how to choose a project and some guidelines on what a suggested type of project would be good. 
but uh, we thought the students did extremely well in choosing projects that suited their own areas of interest. So teaching open source, in the last couple of minutes I'd like to mention this. This is a, an effort um, people from all over the world are involved in to create teaching materials for free and open source software. And so I didn't discover this website until after we'd given this course, which was rather embarrassing, really, uh, given the amount of research I did into you know, free and open source software uh, materials, but I was just looking in the wrong spot. Plus, this website had only just started a month or two before the course, so you know, some excuses. But this, this is mostly led by um, Greg de Koningsberg, who I think is with uh, Fedora Red Hat, and uh, I hope I've got that right. And uh, you go to teachingopensource.org, and the, on the website, there is links to lecture material from other courses around the world that have similar aims, most of which is available under an open license. There's links, of course, to our course, all of the videos, all of the lectures, etc. Plus, the most important one is a link to an effort to create a Teaching FOSS textbook. And um, I've put my hand up for a couple of chapters of that, and I'm embarrassed to say that I've only written half of the first chapter, um, some various events have got in the way. Um, so if you go and have a look at the chapter with my name on it, you'll find it stops abruptly uh, fairly early on. Uh, but other people have done put more effort into their chapters, and we're hoping to create a textbook which in future years could be used, um, printed and used by universities, or printed using one of the print-on-demand services, and uh, to provide a really good textbook for these types of courses. So what can you do? Final thing. Um, you came, you, you're obviously interested a little bit in FOSS in education if you came along to this talk. Um, I'd, what I'd like you to do is think about your own university if you've, been, if you've had a university education. Think about the lecturers that you might know that might have an interest in free and open source software and maybe drop them in line suggesting that they look up the teaching open source site, suggest they look up the Comp 8440 site. Um, and maybe suggest that their university might like to run a course like this, either at grad, uh, undergraduate or graduate level. Because if we can get a lots of universities doing this and make it just part of the standard computer science curriculum that people learn about FOSS, then I think that would be of enormous benefit to our community as well as to the IT industry as a whole. So, final thing is some URLs. Um, this is where you can get various information, the teachingopensource.org. I've mentioned the CS course. And, of course, all of the lectures from last year's course are available in video format or as slides. So, thank you very much. Well, as appreciation from the organisers, uh, Andrew and Bob, uh, there is one bottle of wine we don't Bob, actually stretch I don't drink budget. wine, so there you go, Bob. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, I don't know how we're doing for time, but I think that there are a couple of people with questions still. Okay, well, if um, um, there can we... Sorry. Sorry, there's meant to be a 15-minute break between this and the next lecture, I think. Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah. So you might want to continue question time during that. Right, okay, so if, if anyone wants to ask any more questions, please put your hand up. Yep, down here. How, how easy Right. So the question is, how easy would it be to do this as an industry short course for people to come in? And in fact, the brochures we've got here, we've got a whole bunch of brochures on this, and we brought them along last year. The aim was that we were going to get people to do it as an industry short course, and the assessment part of the course was optional if you came in as an, uh, from industry. And we actually, we only got people last year from the master's program at ANU. But um, again this year, there is the option of taking this course um, as a, like you would do a, uh, an industry course. Uh, I've forgotten the terminology, what it's called. There's a, there's some term that ANU uses for that, like it means industry short course, basically. Um, and I think it would work very well. I think that a number of people could benefit from that quite a lot. Um, but um, last year we didn't get any takers on that, probably because we didn't actually have the option of signing up for that until a couple of weeks before the course began. And it was a little short notice to try to get people to, uh, to do that. There were some problems with the website. But if you know of somebody who might be interested in doing that, then, again, that is available again this year. It's five days, though, which may be too hard for some people. And if you're on a brochure, there's a whole stack of them here. Uh, down here, the front? Okay. 
we didn't choose the projects. The students chose the projects, but using some guidelines that we gave them about the, for example, the activity in the project, make sure it's a project that's had at least, you know, 10 commits in the last couple of months, make sure the project has had active mailing list, et cetera, et cetera, right? These sort of guidelines. Um, the only negative experience, I think, was... Um, uh, one student who didn't get a response back from the project, and uh, they then spoke to us and discussed it, and we, they switched to a different project which did respond extremely well. So, um, I mean, some projects, when you choose them, they're just, you know, uh, the project is either dead and you can't tell. And in, in fact, that particular case, the students had, had violated the guidelines, had, had chosen a project, which, you know, they're free to do if they wanted, they're just guidelines, had chosen a project that hadn't had a commit for a couple of years. Right, it was a dead project. Um, but it was in their area of interest. They were interested in the project. It's just that it was dead. And they could have taken over and said, I'm going to fork it, but that's really beyond the sort of scope of a, one, a few day course. Yep. Could I? Do. Could I stab I'm going to, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to. <laughs> um, can we? Yeah. Um, if anybody wants to ask questions of Andrew and Bob, I suggest we take it out to the, um, out into the okay. foyer there. Yeah? Yep. Feel um, free to, to great. tackle us afterwards. Um, until we can get on with the next uh, presentation. Okay? Cheers. Thanks very much. And grab the brochures. <laughs> yep. You want this back? <laughs>